Hi, Paul. Hello. How are you? How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. How Good. are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yes. Sorry, I'm a little bit late here. Have you ever had it where you're running a little late and somebody tells you they're running a little late? That's always the sweetest sound in the world. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad it worked out for both of us. <laughs> My wife was, was brewing some coffee, and I thought, you know, a cup of coffee would be perfect. <laughs> perfect. I'm glad. Well, enjoy. Well, thank you so much for making the time to do this. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Paul. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the man that you see... We are joined by one of the top pianists in the country, Bill Charlop. He is a Grammy award-winning recording artist. He's accompanied the greatest artists of all time. We could go anywhere from Tony Bennett, Phil Woods, Freddie Cole, Wynton Marsalis. He also leads the Bill Charlop Trio, along with Kenny Washington and Peter Washington. And uh, he's a relative of a past guest on this show, Dick Hyman. So it's a great pleasure to interview you. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm glad to be here with you. So you could say, and we'll get into this a little more, but w would you say that music is in your blood? Well, I was certainly born into a musical family. So I don't ever remember a time when music wasn't central to my being. I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about your parents. My father was Moose Charlap, and he was most famous for the score of the Mary Martin production of Peter Pan, songs like I'm Flying, and I've Got a Crow, and I Won't Grow Up, and Tender Shepherd, things like that. And he also wrote uh, many other scores, um, popular songs that were recorded by major artists like Sarah Vaughan, Joe Williams, Astrid Gilberto, Rosemary Clooney, Freddie Cole, many others. Um, my mother is a great singer. Her name is Sandy Stewart, and she was a regular on the Perry Como show, on the Mitch Miller show. She appeared on Ed Sullivan. She toured with Benny Goodman for a number of years, and she was Grammy nominated in the 1960s for Candor and Ebb's first hit song, which was called My Coloring Book. Quite an interesting uh background from your parents there i'm guessing tell us was music was it encouraged in the home well it certainly wasn't discouraged <laughs> uh i think it was more of a given it was neither encouraged nor discouraged it just simply was what i did and what we did and i think it was always understood that that was what my life was about and certainly what my parents' lives were about. And it continues because my wife is Rini Rosnes and Rini Rosnes is one of the world's greatest jazz pianists and composers. And she's played with, well, everyone from Wayne Shorter to Joe Henderson, to James Moody, to JJ Johnson, to Ron Carter, to Bobby Hutcherson and is recently the uh, leader and organizing force behind a group called Artemis, which is a wonderful group, a septet that happens to consist of all women, some of the premier female jazz musicians in the world. And she's a leader and a composer in her own right. So we play together also. We play two pianos together and have recorded together so music is all over the place. My brother, Tom Charlap, is a great bass player. And he's about 10 years my senior. And he introduced me to a lot of music, a lot of recordings. And just by osmosis, I learned quite a deal from my brother, Tommy. 
Well, I'm hoping we can get into Rini Rosness a little bit and her work. I was listening to a lot of recordings of hers, and wow, such such beautiful work. Is it an advantage to have this much talent under one roof at your house? You always have somebody who knows a lot about music that you can say, how does this sound? What What is it like for you? Well, first of all, we're each other's partners and best friends and we're married. Mm -hmm. So that's first. Uh, and second, we have music, of course, which is central to both of our lives. So it's just a natural part of our communication. I wouldn't say it's separate. It's a, a continuous part of our lives. And we certainly do learn from each other. And uh, we may uh, lean on each other's perspectives if we're looking for another perspective. But mostly, we simply respect each other and support each other's vision. This last year, 2020, was a, a very atypical year, to say the least. Yes. And as somebody who a part of what you do is to frequently perform in public, has, was there any realization that you had over this last year? Anything that came to you? I don't know if this is a unique perspective, but we miss everybody. Yeah. We miss the togetherness of one-on-one -on -one communication. One-on-one -on -one communication, just one person to one person in a small audience of 20 people, 123 people, or 3,000 people. We miss each other, and we miss the people that we play with. We miss the community. So, of course, that's... Um, like I said, not a unique perspective. I think everybody's gone through that. And the times that we've been able to play with our partners, our musical partners, have been really precious. I've been lucky in that uh, even in this time, well, you know, for me, this is not a lot of performances, but I was counting them up recently. And since March, perhaps I've done about, about 16 performances. That's not a lot for our usual schedule. And it probably went down from within that time to now about 160 performances to 16 performances, something of that kind of ratio. But it did uh, underline the honor of when we do get to make music together. Uh, but we miss performing because we miss communicating directly and on a very human level, not just to a camera, knowing that we are touching other people uh, on a human level. And that's, that's real too, that matters. You know, that you can feel that you care that people are watching and listening and you want to give, but um, we miss the intimacy, of course. Has there been anything that you've been working on during this time, even if it's just the planning stages? Well, I'm always doing the same things that I've always done, <laughs> which is that I'm studying and I'm learning more about all of the music that I'm playing and learning more about my instrument and how to express myself more deeply on it, its history, what some of the masters of the instrument have done, thinking about music on a large scale, what my goals may be within my group. And uh, I've also been very fortunate in that I've continued to teach uh, in the capacity as director of jazz studies at William Patterson University. So I've been connected with many young and brilliantly talented students at the same time as this has been going on. So I've been able to learn from them and share with them my experience. 
and uh, try to open some doors of imagination and discipline for them that can be useful. But specifically, I just keep working towards all of the things I've always worked towards. And I've had the time to really think about some more about the nuance of sound that I'm making at the instrument, uh, the nuance of a real art technique, meaning creating a vocal technique at the piano or a drum-like technique, the nuance within the line, the uh, depth of rhythmic dynamic and swing at the piano. And swing doesn't necessarily mean uh, the traditional four to the bar within the stricture of the four bar or three bar or any metric number of bar um, divisions. But I do mean phrasing and the depth of phrasing that can come from not just connecting notes evenly or more percussively, but from the type of vocal and drum nuances that one tries to create as a player. And that all of the great, great improvising pianists and concert pianists have. So doing a lot of listening from Earl Hines and Thelonious Monk and Tommy Flanagan and Red Garland and Sonny Clark and Jimmy Rolls and Teddy Wilson and Bill Evans to the great concert pianists, Vladimir Horowitz, Glenn Gould, Sviatoslav Richter, uh, Martha Argerich, Ivo Pogorelich, Richard Good, all of these wonderful giants. And I've had some time to learn some classical pieces I've wanted to learn for a long time. And that's been very nice to have that luxury. Um, not talking about a huge repertoire or even really highly demanding technical pieces, although every piece is virtuoso, whether it's a Bach minuet or a Chopin etude. And, uh, but there is a, a couple of Brahms intermezzos I've always wanted to get closer to, and I have a B minor adagio of Mozart. I've been playing a couple of the Chopin waltzes, one of the Chopin etudes, some, uh, rediscovered uh, image, what are called the image oubli of Debussy that were only discovered around 1977, but are well-known pieces now. Uh, and some other works, not to mention just simply getting deeper into mood indigo and angel eyes. And I mean that in a, a profound way, really looking at the nuance of how they're built and uh, the lyrics and uh, how I can find a way to, uh, by boring towards the center of them, get closer to something that's meaningful and personal. Do you think that there is a possibility of a Bill Charlotte classical album at some point? No. End of story. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. I really don't think that we need a Vladimir Horowitz or a Glenn Gould or a Sviatoslav Richter or a Ivo Pogorelich or a Richard Good jazz album either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying that it belongs to me and not them or that that belongs to them and not me, but they've spent their entire lives living in that music. I'm not saying I'm a dilettante, but next to them I am. And uh, I don't see that there's a reason for the world to hear me play that music. I'm not saying I might not even uh, play one of those pieces or grab something from it um, at the Vanguard or uh, anywhere else, but it's not primary. It's more about me getting closer to the instrument and, of course, getting into the mind of, um, you know, uh, the giants uh, like uh, 
Robert Schumann and Arnold Scherenberg, as much as I'm getting into the giants of Billy Strayhorn and Thelonious Monk and Duke Ellington. It's not separate, but it is another world. And um, I don't uh, necessarily feel that that's what God put me on this earth to do. I think there are people who are deeply more qualified. I'd much rather hear per Peter Serkin, uh, God rest his soul, but I did hear him play that uh, B minor adagio, and that's what made me want to play it. But I think uh, as, uh, as good as I get at it, when I listen to Serkin play it, or Horowitz, or um, Alfred Brendel, they're closer to it than I think I'm ever going to be. And that's all right. It's not my goal. <laughs> However, I, I sure love Keith Jarrett's Shostakovich. It's magnificent. So for some people, for sure. Have you ever met Keith? I have. What is he like? He was very, very nice to me. He's known as being such an elusive person. <laughs> Well, he was very kind. I only mm -hmm. met him once. I was with my wife. Uh, Rini and I had gone to hear him play at Carnegie Hall, and he played um, a completely extemporaneous solo piano concert, save for, I think, uh, the last two pieces. They were encores, and I'm having a hard time remembering exactly what songs they were, but they were quite well known songs maybe blame it on my youth and over the rainbow or something like that which he played magnificently um maybe it was easy to remember whatever it was the concert itself was a, a a real tour de force of uh just pianism for one thing but musical um it, it was a it was truly amazing to hear what he was able to sustain. And for that matter, the development or whatever it was that was happening on that night, uh, I think um, he was being particularly uh, very free with his harmony and there was um, diatonic harmony, there was pan tonic harmony, there was atonal harmony, there was bitonal harmony, all kinds of things were going on. And uh, it was really, uh, it, but there was not a second that you weren't gripped by it. There was nothing that was, uh, they were actually rather short pieces. It was quite different from the Cone concert, Jarrett, which is wonderful too. Anyway, we went backstage afterwards and um, I was delighted that uh, as people were, he was receiving people, his um, manager who was there said, Bill, Rini, come in, Keith would love to say hello to you. And, and he said, hello, Bill, hello, Rini, which made me feel wonderful. I was delighted that he knew who we were. There wouldn't have been a reason for him to have known us. I think I met him once again backstage about 20 years before when he was playing the Samuel Barber Piano Concerto, which was early on in his uh, life of being a concert pianist. Anyway, the long answer is uh, he couldn't have been more humble and nicer. And uh, I was delighted to meet such a great artist. Well, what is it like for you when you, uh, particularly bef before 2020, when, when you would perform and somebody would come up to you and you, you, you got this feeling of admiration from them they're a fan of your work. Uh, what's that experience like? It's very gratifying to know that you touch somebody on a visceral level and you hope to uh, feel that uh, you're able to give them the attention of that moment so that they feel honored. That's all. Uh, it's, of course, it's a very nice feeling. It's a makes you feel humble and makes you feel gratified. Is there any kind of commonality that you notice amongst fans of this type of music, fans of jazz music? Um, intelligence. And uh, 
originality, you know, honesty, um, all kinds of people. Uh, there's no generation gap and there's no, uh, there's just no gaps. There's no divisions. We're all part of the human race uh, without sounding, um, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, false. I, that's actually quite true. That's just it. You have a feeling of uh, uh, people who know how to listen mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, that's been my experience. That's all, you know. You know, I've mentioned this a couple of times on, on this show, but the last concert that I saw before everything closed and, and you couldn't go to a concert hall was Tony Bennett. And it was uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day. And then everything started to close down after that. And a, a lot of times when I think about live music, I think about it, I'm so happy that I saw that. It was, it was quite a show to be the last show before everything closed. And it, yeah. it's, it's a happy thing, but also sometimes I've thought about it and I just got kind of misty eyed, you know? And yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping you can tell us what is it like when you have seen people interacting with Tony Bennett? Is well, he looks in their eyes and he listens and uh, he's very present and um, very communicative. And I think that uh, he loves to connect with people. That's why he um, is able as a, a nonagenarian to communicate so beautifully uh, in, a, in a concert environment with 3,000 people or just one-to-one, -one. you know? He loves to sing and he loves to communicate. He loves to tell a story. Uh, I've never seen him not uh, treat someone with uh, a fan with kindness. I'm hoping we can talk about the album uh, that, you, that you produced with him. And is, is he different to work with than other artists in particular? Well, remember that he's been doing this a long, long time. And he comes from an era where you would walk into the recording studio, the orchestra was ready to go, things were rehearsed, you had the greatest pros both in the recording booth in the orchestra and in terms of orchestrators, in terms of musicians, and uh, they would walk in and do things in one and two takes. And that was it. They weren't sitting around and using um, uh, vocal manipulations and uh, programs which put people's voices in tune when they're not. Uh, I'm not saying that one would never use editing, but it was very, very rare. And only if there were a train wreck or something really necessary to have to be done. So um, one of the things about recording with... Uh, Tony, particularly on the album you're talking about called The Silver Lining, which was a really a collaboration between Tony and myself and my trio also, who is featured on the album, and my wife, Rini Rosness, who is also featured on the album. And of course, it's all Jerome Kern songs. When Tony came to sing, he would come in, do a take and say, okay, I, I think that's it. <laughs> and we may say, well, maybe let's try another just for fun to see what we get, not because we need something better. And here is the point I'm making. They were never the same. They were never the same. He would phrase differently. He might actually change notes within the melody in the beautiful way that he would, in the beautiful way that the greatest singers do, from Louis Armstrong to Billie Holiday to all of the great ones. And um, so in that sense, it's the same for Jerry Mulligan or Phil Woods or Clark Terry or, or uh, Benny Carter or any of the giants, Jim Hall. They give everything right away. And the feeling of being extemporaneous 
very important. It allows for us to try to do what we're really trying to do when we make a recording, which is capture a moment of magic, you know? You, it's hard to capture a butterfly jumping off of a flower the second time and say, take two. It's gonna be a nice jump, second time probably too, but it's gonna be different. So, you know, you're trying to capture that magic and to do that, you have to have the courage to take a risk. And when you take a risk, if it doesn't work, so big deal, then you get a second chance. But if you get comfortable with taking risks, you get better at getting there. And you also get better with accepting maybe what did come out might not be what you meant, but it's good too. And if you can get some perspective from that, sometimes you say, hey, that's pretty good. So if anything, watching Tony work, I was watching him and listening throughout the years. I was listening to a lot of experience uh, the experience of having already made many great classics and uh, many extremely good recordings, whether they were classics or not. So that was remarkable. Also, he liked to do things in my favorite way, the way a real jazz musician does. And, He's a jazz musician in the sense that he's reacting to what he's hearing. He's not just singing what he's singing and you are weaving just a carpet behind him that he's on top of. If I play a chord, he reacts to that chord. If Rini plays a chord, he reacts to that chord. He reacts to maybe the nuance of the color and the dynamics and all of those sort of things. And for that, uh, when we recorded Trio, he was right there in the room. Nobody was in a booth. Nobody was isolated. Same thing, the two pianos, two pianos in the room. He stood right there in the middle. When it was just piano and voice, we weren't in a booth with headphones on. We were right next to each other. And uh, sometimes I'll hear engineers say, well, you're going to get a lot of bleed then. And <laughs> I understand on a technical level, if you want to capture the instruments in the best way, possible. Sometimes you do need to have some separation, whether they're baffles or other rooms. But in our music, bleed is what you want. <laughs> That's exactly what we want. We want to, uh, we want the blues and the reds and the yellows and the greens to bleed with each other. They have to touch sometimes to become another color that we didn't expect. Um, doing that record was a really a very easy thing to do because it was simply a matter of Tony calling me and saying hey I want to do something together what do you want to do should we do it as a duet or with your trio or with Rini he was aware of all those things and he he liked all of those different things and I said well he said I like to do Jerome Kern what do you think I said sure that makes absolute sense you know uh he is really the pinnacle of the great American popular theater writers, the one that all, he came first. He's a little older than Gershwin, Kern, uh, Gershwin, Berlin, Porter, Rogers, Harlan, Ellington. Um, and uh, um, he's a little bit older and he kind of paved the way for the greatest popular songwriters and theater writers. So it made perfect sense. Plus for me, there was a little extra musical thing, which I was happy about. I learned those songs from two of my greatest mentors who are the great pianist, Dick Hyman, who I know you know well and have interviewed here and uh, who was my mentor and a distant cousin on my father's side, as you said. Um, and uh, my mother, Sandy Stewart, they made an album of Jerome Kern songs. So I grew up with those songs. So to now play them with Bennett. And also, uh, as he said, how do you want to do it? I said, well, why don't we do all three? That will make it special. And it will still be integrated 
it will be like orchestrating differently for each song. And for that matter, it's still family because Kenny and Peter are my family. We've been together as a trio for 23 years now. And Rini is my wife. And here we are doing Kern that I learned from my cousin and my mother. In a way, all of those things created some very nice synergy. But the idea was that depending on the piece on the song, its lyrical content and what rhythmic trajectory we're, we were going to give it, then that would dictate the choice of orchestration in terms of trio, duo, or solo duo performance. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we made the date in two days, maybe three, because I think there was a snowstorm. So I think that we did the dates, uh, I think we did the trio date in one day. When they took breaks, we did the few solo tracks. And then we brought in the second piano and Rini and I worked for a day. We were gonna come back the next day, but I think there was a, a nor'easter. So we had to wait a few days and come back again. And that was that. You know, you said uh, we were hoping that magic would strike well, I know many, many people have told you all this, but when I was writing down notes for what I wanted to talk about in this interview, I wrote down, look for the silver lining dash magic. Oh. Because you guys, it's just a, it's just a, an incredible recording. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm proud of that album. And I know that he is too. And, uh, what makes me happy about it is that I think each song is served. And of course, he sounds magnificent. The players played beautifully. The uh, harmonic underpinnings are the right colors for the lyrics and for the feelings of the songs. And each one of the song had some sense of uh, a definitive way of approaching it, or at least a way that maybe didn't sound like anybody else. I think that that just came from naturally being ourselves, but I'm, I'm very happy with how it came out. And we were lucky enough to win a Grammy. So some people, uh, some other people thought so too that year. When you get a review, when you're reading a review, is it something that you really take to heart? Is it something, I, I mean, I remember, I'm trying to remember who this was and I asked him, do you read the reviews? And he said, I only read the reviews if they're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously nobody wants to read something derogatory and you're putting your soul out there. So nobody wants to feel that, uh, uh, nobody wants to be hurt. So uh, at the same time, I've probably learned things from what would not be considered a good review. Sometimes you learn something about the reviewer. Sometimes you learn something about something that uh, you might want to look at yourself but it may not be necessarily the reviewer's criticism. You know, the same can happen with a review that's quote unquote good, something someone likes and you might say, yeah, I'm glad they liked it. To me, maybe it was a little bit too much and I might, I might, do a, I might erase and smudge the paint a little bit differently there that, that time, but I'm glad they liked it. Ultimately, of course, we'd all love to get a uh, five-star review on everything that we do, but we're only human and there's only humans reviewing us. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, you know, uh, I'll bet you that if I wrote a review of something, I might write a five-star review and somebody else who is equally valid might write a one-star review. I don't know which one's right. I do believe that 
the best thing a reviewer can do perhaps is to illuminate what's beautiful about what an artist tries to put forth. And then if there's something they don't like, maybe it's nicer to say it's not my cup of tea, but to really be intelligent about what you're talking about. You know, Robert Schumann was a reviewer. He knew a little something about music. <laughs> you know, he was a, George Bernard Shaw was a reviewer. So sometimes there's, I guess, a place for criticism, but ultimately, um, I don't know. Bach never won a Grammy. I never heard about Stravinsky winning one. I know they didn't exist then. Beethoven didn't get one. Uh, did Art Tatum win a Grammy? Maybe not when he was alive. I mean, what can you say? Yeah. <laughs> it gets, you know, it's nice to win. It's nice to have a pop, popular uh, recognition. Um, it's even nicer when people buy tickets and come to the gig and you can feel that you enlighten them. Maybe if it's just one person. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, of course, it's nice to have more than one person so you can get another gig. <laughs> right. But that's that's commerce and that's a, a life in show business. And that's a life in uh, trying to, uh, you know, we all have to find a place where uh, we are being uh, the most ourselves and hopefully find an audience that's interested in that part of ourselves. And that's where it's at. I'm hoping you can tell us a, a little bit about what you have learned from Dick Hyman not only is he just a great, great musician and what a collection of incredible recordings he's made, but he's also just so nice. That's been my experience anyways. Uh, wh what have you learned from, from this guy who you are related to? How much time do you have? <laughs> I really couldn't possibly do more than scratch the surface if I talk to you for the next 12 hours about what I've learned from Dick Hyman. That is not hyperbole. Uh, generosity. The most generous musician I ever met in my entire life. He gave me so much and you know, a lot of what you learn, what do you learn from your parents? What they model for you more than anything else. He loves music. He is constantly in a state of study, in a state of awe of music. And he's not, well, he's a great educator. You know, he's done all kinds of things in terms of, um, incredible, incredibly valuable contributions to the world of jazz and music pedagogy uh, from his, well, you know, uh, I remember a, a, a CD-ROM, remember those? I think it's now been uh, remade into uh, his uh, Centuries of Jazz Piano with a DVD at the end of it. Uh, but more than that, many uh, written books on the, on the uh, music, like those two fake books that were made. They were called something like A Hundred Tunes That Every Pro Should Know. It's a much longer title than that. And the second one was called All the Right Changes. They made it a few more, but there are a hundred songs in each. It's a fake book. They're lead sheets, but such erudite lead sheets with all of the real correct harmony coming straight from the composer, the melodies written correctly, the lyrics written correctly, and more than that, with the insight of a grand master of not just jazz piano and piano harmony and orchestral harmony and arranger's harmony, but the experience of uh, an understanding of American harmony classical harmony and jazz harmony throughout. So just the small amount of alternate harmonies that are written, and in the original publication, they were written above in red. Later, they were produced a little bit less expensively with uh, light gray above. 
instead of the color copies. Those books are absolutely essential. Okay, now there are some pedagogical books and I, they're Bibles for me and Bibles for my students. I bring my students to them. I think they're out of print now, but, but uh, they're still available. Um, Dick Hyman was never my private teacher in that uh, we weren't meeting on a weekly basis and a teacher gives assignments. That's really important. It really needs to be come back next week with this learned, come back next week with this learned. You really need to have uh, some goals in mind, whether you're teaching yourself or you're studying with somebody. Dick Hyman didn't have the time to do that with me. He was way too busy in the studios, performing, composing, all kinds of, you know, he's such a polymath musically, everything from film scores to solo piano to jazz dates to uh, directing a major jazz series and performing all over the world. When I met him, uh, when I was in my early teens, was about 14 or 15, and went to his apartment and played for him, he uh, sent me to Jack Riley, who was a great, great private teacher who really did give me graded lessons and take me um, from point A to point B and was a, a great teacher and pianist and composer. But Dick Hyman was so generous in that he would invite me over all the time and play me records and play with me and show me things hands on the old school way. You know, how do you do that? Well, let me show you. Let's play that together. Well, think about this. Lighten up your touch there. Uh, maybe you're moving a bit too much here. Listen to the, your line is very beautiful. Why don't you listen to the way Benny Carter plays these lines? Think about putting some more spaces in it. Hey, I'm doing a record date next week. Why don't you come along? Hey, I'm, I've written a ballet for Twyla Tharp. We have rehearsal next week. Come with me. Uh, I'm doing a film score for Martin Scorsese. Oh, can you go in the other room? Mr. Scorsese's coming over for a minute. I need to talk to him. <laughs> you know, stuff like that is going on in my life with him. And uh, many, many times, you know, I'm going to Waterloo Village to, uh, to play a solo piano concert. You wanna take a drive with me? And during that drive, I've got to listen to some tapes of a solo piano record. I just didn't choose the takes. You can't get better lessons than that. And uh, you know, the Shel Sel Silverstein book, The Giving Tree, I'm sure. Oh you know? yeah. Yes, well. That's Dick Hyman. Mm -hmm. And that's about how I feel about that. So I can't say enough about that type of generosity. And another thing, here is a colossal force in music in terms of success, in terms of prowess, and in terms of artistry and everything else. And there was never any arrogance or selfishness or stinginess because he was so comfortable in who he was and to be able to give that way. And by the way, I know I feel I'm very special to have had this. I want to tell you something. I've talked to a lot of young pianists who have been around his meteor they all feel the same way mm. that it was them. And that tells you something too. I mean, I know I was lucky to be quite close, but it wasn't like uh, that generosity wasn't shared with many, many, many. So what else did I learn from him? What a touch, what an imagination, what an incredible imagination. And it's voracious. And he never, ever stopped practicing and learning. That faucet is just open, you know? And uh, yeah, so it's not just a faucet, you know, the, the funnel is open. Mm -hmm. More information going in there all the time. <laughs> so that's just a little scratch of the surface. It's wonderful to hear your, your, your love for him. That's great. I like it. He's a great man. <laughs> He's a great person, too. He's a great person. Mm -hmm. 
you've done so many of these albums where following the the jazz tradition of finding a collection of songs by a certain composer. Hmm. This may be an almost impossible question. Could you pick a favorite composer? Probably not. But, you know, uh, to me, in terms of the great popular songwriters, there is a small Mount Rushmore of writers that are on that constellation, part of that constellation, uh, because their work is the most prolific and the most influential. That doesn't mean there aren't other writers, but I would say there's a, there's a big seven in that group, which are to me of the theater writers and one who's not a theater writer, but only because uh, of racism. He just, he could have been absolutely anything, but that door wasn't open. Um, Kern, Berlin, Gershwin, Porter, Arlen, Rogers, Ellington. Now, there are more, of course. Uh, I don't even know if it's a next tier. It's just that maybe they're not quite as prolific, but it's in humans. There's Arthur Schwartz and Howard Dietz. There's um, the Silva Brown and Henderson. There's Burton Lane, Julie Stein, Cy Coleman. You know, there's a, a there's a, a Hoagy Carmichael. It's a very large group. Uh, Billy Strayhorn. So, do I have a favorite? I've gone through favorites at different times. Mm -hmm. That's all, and they're favorites for different reasons at different times. I don't know what it's been about this last year, but I've just been gobbling up anything Irving Berlin. I've just been nuts about him lately. Can't go wrong. <laughs> you cannot, no. <laughs> Who is it that said Irving Berlin is not part of American popular music? Irving Berlin is American yes. popular music. Well, that's basically it. Yeah. It's so direct. And fa fascinatingly, uh, of course, he wrote the lyrics and the music. And it's so natural and direct. And yet, Berlin can be uh, just quite simple, you know. I mean, quite theatrical, quite... Um, there's no business like show business, you know. Yesterday they told you you would not go far. Last night you opened and there you are. Right, everything drips off, the words drip off the notes. But then Berlin, in his very quiet way, can write so deeply, lyrically and melodically uh, and harmonically and put so much weight in it. I use an example like, like how deep is the ocean? <laughs> That's now, what I was course, thinking of. <laughs> yes, well, and when you think about what he did lyrically and melodically, the blueness of it, the minorness of it, the release of it, the romance of that final release. And you know, the song really could be called How Much Do I Love You? How Deep Is the Ocean is the italics. And of course it's show business. And of course it's a better song title and you're gonna sell more pieces of sheet music with How Deep Is the Ocean. And Irving Berlin was not against selling more music. He was a survivor in the best sense, a real American, a real P.T. Barnum. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, the song is How Much Do I Love You? And if you see what he does theatrically with the lyrics, uh, you know, and uh, by the way, just to digress, they're all my favorites for different reasons. And that's just the songwriters. You know, if you're going to talk about jazz writers, Monk, Kenny Dorham, Horace Silver, Bill Evans, and many, many others. But um, songwriters, for Berlin, what he does there, he says, how much do I love you? That's the exposition, right? That's bum, 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 bum. <laughs> How much do I love you? I'll tell you no lies, right? 
that's very direct. That's between a woman and a man, or a man and a woman, or a man and a man and a woman and a woman. That's direct. That's two people. Then, really big picture. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? Right? The metaphor is beautiful. And also, theatrically, you've got this, how much do I love you? It's direct, eye to eye. Then all the way to the bottom of the ocean, how high is the sky? You have all those pictures. Then he goes back to the interior. How many times a day do I think of you? You know, when you're obsessed with someone, when you're in love, it's all you can do. You wake up in the morning, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you think about them. Go to sleep, you're thinking about them. You're making a sandwich, you're thinking about them. You can't stop, right? How many times a day do I think of you? You're inside of me, you're in my interior. Now, how much do I love you? Between two, I'll tell you no lie. I'm being honest here, so I'm taking a risk. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? The great metaphor and the name of the song, right? The only line that's repeated. How many times a day do I think of you? The interior. Back to the earth. How many roses are sprinkled with dew? The earth, a rose, the fragility of a flower. Okay. Now, we're here. We're sitting at the table. I, I, how far would I travel to be where you are? Huh, that's pretty big. How far would I travel? Now we've gotten eye to eye. How deep is the ocean? How high the sky? The interior, how many times do I think of you? How many roses are sprinkled with dew? The earth. We have the earth, the ocean, the sky, the interior, eye to eye of two. How far would I travel to be where you are? The entire earth. Now we have the space of the earth. And now finally, Berlin says, how far is the journey from here to a star? He just went into hyperspace like Han Solo in Star Wars. <laughs> he just went, right? He went past the sky, past the ocean, and right into the outer stratosphere. And then finally, Berlin does his great stroke of genius. And all of this is underpinned by the harmony and melody, which colors just as beautifully as a Soroya or a John Singer Sargent or a Zorn. He says, he gets really serious now. And if I ever lost you, how much would I cry? Because what is precious? What's he telling you? He's telling you that you're precious. And what makes something precious more than anything else? It will die. Yeah. So it will die like a flower and like the earth, like the petals. And if I ever lost you, how much would I cry? And finally, he sells the song with the big, bold print, how deep is the ocean, how high is the sky? Now that is big. Yeah. And that is real songwriting. And look what he's done, because he's done it in such a way that you could just sing it in a bar and buy that guy a drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to feel all of that but he put it all there. And that's a masterpiece in songwriting. And not to mention the structure itself, of course, is rife with possibility for the improviser and the arranger. So that, uh, yeah, that puts Berlin pretty, pretty far up there near the top. <laughs> Who but else? Could say, I could take you through <laughs> all of the songwriters somewhere and there's something like that. And that's not even, you know, what people might say, oh, that's not the most creative of all Berlin songs, but it just gets gives you an idea of the level of um, magnitude of the writing that's happening in a song like that. And so I think that that's important. Magnitude, indeed. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us and for this very interesting interview. I always like to close the show. I give the guest the proverbial stage. And I know that there will be people who watch this all over the world. What would you say to anyone who is tuned in, watching or listening or both? Oh, listen to each other. 
respect each other, love each other. What else is there? Honor each other. I actually have one more question. Mm -hmm. What is the best thing about being Bill Charlap? Being married to Rini Rosas. It's also pretty good having Vivian Charlotte and Sophie Charlotte and Dylan Drummond as my children. Hmm. Nice. Well, Mr. Charlotte, thank don't you so much. Don't forget Stewart as my mother. Oh, yeah. You can't forget that. And Kathy Charlap and Ann Charlap as my sisters and Tom Charlap as my brother. Other than that, everything else is cool. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Charlep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, sir, have a wonderful day, and thank you for this. Pleasure being with you, Paul. My pleasure. Bye-bye.